uh, Malachi. Please turn with me to the book of Malachi. And we are going to look at the first five verses this morning. If you didn't catch the sermon last week, please do that, because that really lays the foundation for the entire series. It just does. Everything that we do from here on springs forth from that foundation. Remember, Malachi means my messenger. Uh, The the people were back in the land post-exilic, after the exile to Babylon. They had been back. The temple was rebuilt. But what built up in the people is so common, even with so many today in the church, is that apathy towards God. You're not really on fire for the Lord anymore. That zeal is gone, kind of a coldness comes in, and then that even turns into resentment sometimes towards God. And that's where the people like that we're reading about in Malachi's time in God, God's people found themselves. And the, the, underneath that, when you're not satisfied with Christ, when there's some disappointment with the Lord, underneath that is, is really the sin of believing that your God is insufficient, that, that Christ is not sufficient to give you what you need to, to uh, satisfy you in different ways. Um, and so even with Malachi, there are disputes, there, there's contentions and confrontations. And you could see where the people are in their hearts and their mind just by the questions they ask, just how they push back on the Lord. You could see where they're at. And it's a really sad spiritual state. So with Malachi, you want to wake up, man. Come on, realize what you have and who you are in Christ and then live your life in that way. That's such, it's so needed. And, and part of the reason for doing this series is to, to kind of wake us up in that way because we need to be reminded to draw near to the Lord and then to one another and live this life for Christ and to be serious about our faith and our walk in him. So, I'm going to go to Malachi, uh, chapter 1. How many of you guys remember the game Hot Potato when you were growing up? Do they have that still for the kids? I don't know. I haven't seen it around. (laughs) Probably on some ship out, you know, waiting to be brought in. But that was the game where, you know, you you had that that, that potato there, and I don't know, you'd wind it up or whatever, and you'd pass it around to everybody, because you didn't want to have that potato when it blew up or when the uh, when the, the alarm went off, because then you know then you were out of the game. But the whole idea was you didn't want it to explode in your hands. Well, you know this is like a hot potato text right now that we're going to be looking at. It's it's so it's so so many try so hard to pass off what we're going to be looking at this morning, not to deal with it directly, you know, but. We, we don't have an option. This is God's word. We, we can't skirt around it. We can't take off, you know, the rough edges, as it were, in that way. This is his word. And we are commissioned as pastors, as teachers, as elders, and even as Christians to bring forth his word. We have no business trying to uh, water it down or make it easier. This is a tough text for us this morning as we look at it. But it's also a beautiful text of scripture. It might be unpopular, but especially in, in this day that we live in, this God is love only type of day, even among so many Christians. But this is the truth, the theological truth. Soundness often is difficult to, to bring forth. But actually, this is a very profound text. It's, 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 a, it's a beautiful text because it speaks to the nature of God's sovereign love for his people and also perfect justice towards all others. That's basically what this is. And we need to know that, understand that, appreciate this, and bask in the love that Christ has for us and never take it for granted, never get tired of it, never, never get used to it or be too comfortable with it in that way. So the text, Malachi, we'll start in one and we'll read through five. The oracle or the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste to his hill and left his heritage to to the jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may 
build, but I will tear down, and they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do pray, and we do praise you and thank you. We thank you for your word, Lord God, because it is your word to us. And I pray that you would be glorified in this and that we would truly be edified, that we would be um, encouraged and strengthened in seeing, seeing the depth of your love towards such unworthy people such as us, Lord God. So we ask that you would be with us, that our hearts and minds would be engaged in your word this morning, that we would be confronted with your truth and comforted by your truth and by your love, Lord God. So be with me. Help me to bring forth clearly and boldly your word, Lord God. Be with all of us. Be with them. All right, let's start right off with the confrontation. Here it is. Here's God's declaration. He says, I have loved you. Oh, how amazing is that? That God says to a people, I love you. Well, what's the response? Right off the bat, it is, man, it's just like, how have you loved us? It's just met by skepticism and, and doubt. How have you loved us? Look, I love you. How have you loved us? They say. So if you, you can hear the, like the resentment if you listen clearly to the response. How, how have you loved us? God, I, I'm God. I love you. How have you loved? And that's pretty arrogant, like pushing back on the Lord. You could tell that the people are pretty far gone by this point. And right away, for God to even condescend to, to answer a question like that to, to these people shows the depth of his love and his patience towards us, even us, his people, right? That's an amazing thing that God does to even say, to, to even address this because they should know. They should understand after everything that God has done for them and is doing among them that he loves them. And yet, he demonstrates that love and his patience by answering. It's almost like um, those ungrateful children that, that you raise. You do everything for them as a parent. You love them. You bring them into this world. You care for them. You pay for them. You protect them. You provide for them and all that. Then they grow up at some point and say, oh, I hate you. You never even love me, mom and dad. And I'm out of here. It's like, what? Do you know how much? You don't realize how much I love you. Yeah, we're not perfect as parents. But, you know, imagine standing before God and saying, how have you loved us? Well, God answers in three important ways in this text this morning that demonstrate his sovereign love. And I want you to get this. This is a real clear outline today. and It's real easy. Um, three points. So it just kind of falls that way this morning. So number one, he answers this question in three important ways. Number one, his love is unconditional. That's how he's loved you, right? His, his love is unconditional. Number two, the fact that his love is undeserved. Unconditional, undeserved, and then Finally, the fact that his love is universal. In other words, it's not universalism that every single person is going to be saved, but his love is universal that the gospel extends beyond the borders of Israel and goes to the ends of the earth. That's how he shows his love. And that's in the text this morning. Number one, his love is unconditional. He says, I have loved you. What a statement right there. And I've loved you. And that love is unconditional. It's not based on anything. And that's what's so amazing about the love of God for his people. It's not based on anything that you do, anything that you are, anything that you may do. It's, it's not anything inherent within you. He doesn't look at you and say, oh, you're a lovely person. I think I'll love you. Oh, you're not so great. I'm, I'm going to love. It's not like that. Nothing inherent within them. Even the nation of Israel, he, he, he chose them for his purposes to glorify himself in Deuteronomy um, chapter seven, verses six through eight. For you are a people holy to the Lord, your God. The Lord, your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you for you were the fewest of all people. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the land, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So it's not based 
on their worth or their wealth or their status or their position. Just that mere, mere fact alone should cause us to be in great awe and amazement of God's love for us. Why me, Lord God? His love is unconditional. And he mentions here, um, it is not, is not Jacob, is not Esau, Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob. Remember Jacob and Esau? We're not going to spend too much time in this. When we get to our, our series in Romans, we'll deal with this extensively. But you remember Jacob and Esau. They were the twins. Father of two nations. Neither of them were perfect in any way, by any stretch, obviously. You know, you know the story. Neither of them are deserving of God's favor. But God, according to his mercy, according to his plan, for his own purposes, set his love on Jacob and that extends all the way to all who believe in Christ. For Abraham's offspring, heirs to what the Lord has given to uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all who believe. So I do want you to turn with me to Romans 9, because I do want you to see that his love is unconditional. Again, that's not the, um, the thrust of, of, of the entire message this morning. We'll deal with it more extensively later on. But I just want you to see now that it's not conditioned on anything in us or that we do. Romans chapter 9, you know the passage. And this is really the fulfillment of, the, the greater fulfillment of what's being said in Malachi. So Romans 9, beginning in verse 9. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad. Do you understand that? There was nothing good or bad that they've done, no workspace, nothing inherently about that them specifically. Nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice with, on God's part? No, because that's the question. People are going to say, that's not fair. That's not right. Is there, that's unjust. They say, no, it's not. No. Um, is there injustice with God? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. And he goes on from there. I want to show you that the love for his people is based on his good pleasure, upon his sovereign purposes, which he's purposed from all eternity. That's unconditional love. It's not something we deserve. How have you loved us? They ask. This is how I've loved you. You don't even deserve my love. But I've chosen to place that upon you. So in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, we read this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ, Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Unconditional love that we should be holy and blameless before him. And then it goes on to say, in love, he predestined us to adoption as sons. In love. That's how I have loved you. Not because of who you are, but actually in spite of who you are, if we really think about it, and, and, and who he is. We fully, freely receive his love. That's, uncondition That's how I've loved you, he says, unconditionally. We love conditions. That's how we're, our minds work. That's how we're trained to think. We always think we need to meet something so that we receive something. And that's really the way of the world in so many ways. And we understand that. But when it comes to this, it's different. It's the opposite of conditional election. And there are two popular ways that people kind of put conditional election out there. So, so it's something that they could do, something they could earn and say, okay, God, this is, not, this is why God loves me now. Two popular ways. Number one, this is the generic way. Um, most people, if you ask most people, why should you go to heaven? Why should God let you in, in, into heaven when you die? What would you say, people say to you when you ask them? 
I'm good. I try. I, I do my best. I'm, you know, I'm honest. You know, so I kind of list off all the virtues and, you know, check the boxes in that way. I've never murdered anybody. I've, I've done, see, that's a very popular way of trying to earn God's favor, that, that conditional election based on what I do. People love to play this game all the time. I might not be great, but I'm not terrible either, right? I'm, I'm pretty good, and hopefully I'll make that cutoff line when God comes at, at the end of the age. So they try to meet certain conditions so as to perhaps earn God's favor, earn a spot on a team, earn a place in heaven by, by being a good person, by being honest, by being generous, by being caring, nice and dutiful, on and on it goes, right? If, if I could be like this, then hopefully God will take that into account. That's conditional election, really. That's what that is. There's those conditions that I meet, and hopefully I'll get in. That's very popular. Secondly, it's a, um, this is more theological, a little more technical in terms of election, like God setting his, his love on people. Um, and it goes like this, that God will set his electing love. God will love you because he knew, God knew from all eternity, from eternity past, that you would freely choose Christ. So he kind of looks down the corridors of time and, and he sees at this point in time that you freely of your own volition, of your own will, that we will decide to choose him. Based on that, he chooses you. He loves you. And that seems fair to us. That, that's a pretty good one for most people because now, you know, it's something you do and then God sets his love on that and, and brings you into his family. So on that basis, he elects you. So he elects you knowing that you somehow, some way will choose him first. That's very like man. So we like that because it appeals to us and our sensibility, doesn't it? A couple problems with both of these. In the first case, we're not saved by trying harder. We're not saved by doing better. We're not saved by your best isn't good enough for the Lord. No, it doesn't matter how good you try to be. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Why do you think the Bible says that? Can you keep it perfectly? God, you want that condition? You want those conditions? Okay, go ahead. Look at the Ten Commandments and you keep those perfectly, right? With a, in your mind, not just like your actions, right? I'm not going to kill somebody, but even your mind, you can't even hate anybody. You can't even be really upset with somebody to the point of, oh, I wish there were, oh, something bad would happen to them. That's, that's, you just murdered them in spirit in that way, right? Go ahead. You want, you want the conditions? You want to try and do that? You want to try and keep up with that? How long will you last? Yeah, no, we can't do it. Doing our best doesn't change our sinful nature. We're sinners by nature and choice, both, right? Can, you, can the Ethi Jeremiah thirteen twenty three, the, the rhetorical question, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? No, then you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. No, we can't, we can't change ourselves by nature, we are sinners. We are fallen in Adam. So when people try to say, put those conditions, that conditional kind of love, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. No, nah, that's not going to work. Sorry, doesn't happen. The second one, how can, you know, here's the big question that we need to wrestle with. How is a spiritually dead person when it comes to understanding the nature of sin, the nature of salvation, even the nature of God, we're, we're blind to that. We, 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 we're, the Bible says that spiritually, we're de we don't have the ability in and of ourselves to make us come alive spiritually. God has to do something first within us. And I know that rubs the wrong way. And I, and I would rather preach it. Not really, because I wouldn't rather preach it because God's word doesn't preach it. But it would be easier to preach it the other way and say, yeah, first you do something, then God responds to you in, in that way. But the, the whole testimony of Scripture is not like that. When God chooses somebody, he chooses them. That's it. So you can go back all the way to, to the garden. He sought out Adam and Eve. They weren't looking for him. He went to them, right? Abraham, right? We can go on and on through, through Moses, we can go on through David that the Lord pursues, right? He, he pursues with his. We're not looking for him. Spiritually, we're unable. Rome, uh, Ephesians 2 says this about us. 
you were dead. He's talking to Christians now, past tense. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. How does a dead man come alive in and of himself? That's a supernatural work of God. That's the unconditional love. If we can make ourselves alive, okay. Romans 8, verse 8 says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. They can't do it. I want you to listen to this, and I want you to hear this. If God's love was conditioned by something in us, then he's a terrible God, right? If if his love for us is conditioned by something in us, then he is a terrible God because there's nothing in us that can earn, that can merit, that deserves his love and his favor. Do you understand that? That's what you have to get. That's a big deal. That's a big point if you're going to understand the depth of God's unconditional love. When he says, I have loved you, even though you don't deserve my love. That's amazing. That's the difference with Christianity. That's the difference about our God. How could you make your person who doesn't truly desire him come to a knowledge of him? If we're enemies of God, I have loved you. How have you loved us? How have I loved you? How my unconditional love that you don't deserve? How have I loved you? I've loved you from all eternity. From all eternity. This is how I've loved you. I've purposed your salvation. The salvation of his people has been purposed from all eternity. Ephesians 1, again, 3 and 4. Um, well, I'm not, we're not going to put it back up there because we had it up there already. But from all eternity, he has purposed that love. I have chosen them in Christ when? Before the foundation of the world. Not at some point in time when he thought of before the foundation of the world. Before they did anything good or bad. That's how he shows his love. How much have I loved you? I loved you enough to send my only begotten son to pay the price for your sin. John 3.16. For God, what? So loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have, have everlasting life. How much has he loved us? Romans 5, 8 tells us God shows his love. He shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, when we didn't deserve it, Christ died for us. How have I loved you? What have you done to deserve my? How can we say to him, how have you loved What an insult that is to God. And yet he patiently condescends and answers with an unconditional love. With a love that keeps you from falling. With a love that sustains you. With a love that's genuine, true, and everlasting. Romans 8, 38, and 39. For I am sure this is how he loves you. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things past things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from what? From the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is how I've loved you unconditionally without you doing anything to earn it because you can't. That's number one. Number two, He loves us with a love that's undeserved. It's just undeserved. Um, Verses 3 and 4. I'll go back to 2. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I, I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste to his hill country and left his heritage to the jackals. If Edom says... We are shattered, but we will we build the ruins. The Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear it down. And they will be called the wicked country. And the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. That's tough stuff, isn't it? That's hard to read, especially in a context of which we live in, where God is just all oh, just a, simply a God of love. He's at our beck and call. He, you know, that's that's all he ever pours out. There's, you know, we don't talk about the wrath or the justice of God, especially in this day and age. But we have to talk about the wrath and justice of God because that's holy as well, and because that is who God is. And it shows us that his love is undeserved. And when he says, and I'm just going to be straight with you, when he says, 
Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated. He's not saying Jacob I love, but Esau I love less. And I still love him, but just less. No, that's not the word that's used. When he says Esau I have hated, that's what it means. But here's what it means. So get this. It's not that spiteful, vindictive, Oh, I hate you kind of thing. And, 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 you know, it's kind of almost irrational and just this vengeance towards him in that way. That's not what it means biblically when we talk about God hating something. When we talk about God's hate, it refers to God's hate being judicial, in other words. It's just like how you hate when something bad happens, when a crime happens, do you love that? Are you good with that? Are you good when a criminal goes away and walks away? You don't love that. Do you love, is it okay when somebody goes into a house and steals and takes and beats and kills and rapes? That's, we don't love that. There's justice that needs to be done, that needs to take place. That's that. We hate it because it's wrong. And it needs to be, it deserves to be punished. That's the idea. God's hate is judicial. It's never capricious. It's not just, oh, I hate you, you know, or it's not arbitrary in that way. That's what this means. It's about his, his justice and his righteousness and his holiness, just like we don't like things that are bad in that way. And we know that they need to be punished. It's holy. It's not vindictive. It's just, it's not spiteful. It's treating them as their sin and rebellion against God deserves. So when you hear that, Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated. It's God justly, justly choosing to withhold his mercy. That's what that is. Now, does that mean God's love isn't apparent even for unbelievers? It is. How many unbelievers, how many people that hate God, deny God's existence, pretend that there is no God, or if they do know there's a God, they still shake their fist at him, and who needs God? We're living in that time, aren't we? Big time right now. We're finding ourselves in that context. Context where people are just not even acknowledging God. If they do acknowledge God, a lot of it's just hateful and spiteful. Who's God? We don't need God. And yet, what does God provide for those people? Every single day, every single breath they take is still yes. Without acknowledging God, without thanking God, shaking their fist at God, the worst of the worst, still get up every morning, still breathe the air, still benefit from the rain and from the sunshine still are able to prosper in this world and feed their family. You think they could do that apart from God? Huh? Did you read what, what Laura put in our, our caption this morning? Now, do you understand that? See, that's the grace of God, even to those who hate him so much and deny him so much. And again, going back to the parent-child, there's some really, really good parents who, whose kids hate them for no other reason because than other than those kids are rebellious. Because they're rebellious. But those parents still love those kids and they still benefit and they're still there for those children, even though those children reject their parents. So, so I want you to understand that as well. Everybody benefits from, from the grace of God, especially his common grace. And, and that's for verse 4. When he says, if Edom says, we're shattered, okay, but we're going to rebuild the ruins. The Lord of hosts says, they're going to build, but I'll tear them down. And they will be called a wicked country. And the people with them... And the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. These are rebellious people against God. But I want you to understand this and check this out. That and here's the point of that. That there is no, there can be no true and lasting success apart from God. The things that we build, the things that, that we construct, whatever they might be, will not satisfy, will not suffice. So you can think from the em empires to philosophers in different philosophies throughout the ages, from, from, from Babel, right, when they wanted to build that, build that tower, to, to Egypt, to Babylon, to the Greek and, and Roman empires, and down through the ages, from all the philosophers with their philosophies, from all the religious movements, from all the psychology and psychiatry, from everything that, that we, we put in place of the Lord will not last. So when he says, I'm going to tear it down, because it's not going to last, because... It cannot save. And because ultimately those things are rooted in opposition to God. Yeah, we're going to build a tower. Yeah, we're going to be like God. Yeah, we're going to reach heaven. Who needs God? I have the, I'm the emperor. You bow down to me. You see that? 
things are, even in our day and age, we're bowing down to like science and to, to certain people that we esteem and the wealthy and the rich. And, and so that we're, they're up there. They're nothing to God. That's why he's saying this. You could go ahead and rebuild, but it's not going to last. It's not going to satisfy. It can't save you, right? And that's a, that's a wicked people. You're showing your rebellion by not thanking God for the gifts that he's given. You're showing your rebellion by, by building against God or ignoring God. And who needs God? Just like what's going on today in our world. How many people acknowledge God? How many of the successful? How many of the elites? I mean, even nice people. Right? That won't last. And that's what's going on here. And that's what he's saying. Edom was a wicked nation. And they, were, they had their gods, their false gods that they built up against the true and living God. So these people receive exactly what they've earned. And really what we all deserve, if we're honest. And this is tough truth, but this is what we deserve, is wrath and judgment from God, which makes the fact that he loves any one of us or even one of us, a stupendous, mind-boggling, mind-blowing, amazing, unbelievable thing, doesn't it? That he would even choose to set his love. So what is, I want you to hear, what is truly amazing is not Esau I have hated. We deserve God's wrath because of our sinfulness and his holiness, what is truly amazing, what's truly hard to really understand and to grasp is that, Jacob, I have loved. Why have you loved us? We're unlovable. Why have you? We're rebellious against you. Why have you loved us? I can understand the hate. I can understand the wrath. But love for me? I know me. You know you. You know your heart. This is how he loves us. So when we see this, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated, when we understand that, we are moved. And here's the application for this portion, an application. What this should do to you personally right now is move you within your spirit to live your life understanding this fact that you don't deserve it, but he's given it to you. You can't earn it, but you have it because of Jesus Christ. So that means that your gratitude should overflow. You should be in awe of your God and never take for granted what you have and who you are in Christ. Do you, do we? That your love should be stronger for your God and for others. That your worship be more meaningful, that you don't just come on Sunday as a routine or you go here, you go there, but you're planted and you're here and you're worshiping your God from your heart. Because of this, It should move us to desire to serve Christ, to obey Christ, to please Christ, to depend on him more and more, to know that he loves you with a love that you don't deserve, that you can't earn. Isn't that unbelievable? But yet you do. So how do I show that in my life? Taking it for granted, asking him, how do you love me, God? I don't have this. I don't love me, God. My life's a mess over here. You have his love and you have him. And that is sufficient to get you through everything and all things. Amen. We're so unworthy. We're so undeserving, which makes it all the more sweeter. And this is a sweet thing to know that this is how he has loved you and love us. Right? How have you loved us? This is how. One more point. His love is universal, Uh, verse 5. I don't want you to miss this. Your own eyes shall see this, and then you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the borders of Israel. So it's not contained. This is uh, amazing about his, his love. His love is universal. Again, not that every single person, not we're not universalists, that every single person will be saved at some point. But in the sense that, Yes, his love is confined to his elect, but his elect inhabit the four corners of the world. That's why we go and preach the gospel. That's why we live for Christ. It extends to the nations. As a matter of fact, when the Lord comes back, what's he going to send his angels to do? Matthew twenty four thirty one. I will 
And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will what? They will gather his elect from the four winds. From one end of the heavens to the other. Because the word goes out. And that love goes out to the ends of the earth. Right? He, and that means that he is the only God. There is no other God. There's all kinds of other gods that are, that are um, built by the imagination of men through the histories, through the ages. But can they save you? No. I am God and there is no other. You heard what Aaron read this morning in the call to worship. You see that? That's why we go. Um, Psalm 22, 27 and 28 promises this. All ends of earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. That's it. That, there's one God. So, so it's going to go beyond the border of Israel, beyond an ethnic group, beyond just a certain uh, location in that way. It goes to the ends of the earth. That's the glory of Christianity and the, and the glory of God as well. Now listen to this. Part of waking people up out of their apathy, like the people in Malachi's time, like people today, even some of us, and then that resentment, like even towards God and then towards God's people. Because when you resent God, you're going to resent people that really love and follow him, even if you claim to be a follower. Well, that's not the God that I love. That's not the God that I want. That's not the God that, that I believe should be there. I want this kind of God, and this is what you should be like. Come on. This is what God is like. He, he reveals himself to us. And if you love him, you're going to love that, and then you're going to seek to promote that. So part of waking people up out of their apathy and resentment is not just personal renewal, not just to be reminded that he loves you unconditionally, that, that, that he loves you with a love that's undeserved. But it's also meant to, to wake you up, to stir you, to bring that gospel beyond the borders of Israel, beyond the borders. Listen, when you love the Lord... When you're trusting in the Lord and you love him so much and you're in his word, what do you want to do? You want to share him. When you bring a baby here, what do you want? Here. When you love somebody and you want to introduce him or her, you want people to know that person because you love them so much. Do you do that with Christ? Do we do that with the Lord? No, but when you're in love with him, remember, man, when you were first converted... For us, for so many of we couldn't get enough. You're just telling people all the time about Jesus. You weren't ashamed. You weren't embarrassed. You weren't afraid. You need Jesus. I'm then you would get rejected, you know, by your family. You're nuts. You're crazy. Get out of here. And, you know, then it's kind of tampered down a little bit. Not that it should be, but usually is. But when you love something, when you love someone, that's when you tell. That's when you show. That's when you see. If you tell how much love for the Lord that you have, by how many people you're telling about the love of the Lord. I just made that up on the spot. I don't know if that even made sense, but you know what I mean. Where there's little love for God, there's little concern for missions. And if you've noticed, even in the past 40 years in our churches today, where are the missions? They're still there. But remember back in the day, we're sending our missionaries out with the love of Christ. We're sending our missionaries out with the gospel. Not so much today. When that love for the Lord grows cold, then you're not really interested in telling other people about him. No, he's there and he's, he, he, yeah, he loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Just trust in Jesus, but live the life the way you want. And it's not serious. When you really know him, when you really love him, you're going to tell others about him because you know what they need. That love that you have, that salvation that you have, the change that he makes. You can't contain it. That's why he says that great is the Lord beyond the borders of Israel itself. You see, that's how I've loved you, God says. The people got arrogant. I have loved you. How have you loved us? I've loved you with a love that's unconditional. I loved you with, with a love that's undeserved. You don't deserve this. And I love you with a love that's universal that goes out. Are you asking? Let me look, man. What are you asking in your hearts? Are you asking? How have you loved me, Lord? Look at my life. Look what's going on. Look what's happening. How do you love me? How have you love us? The question ought to be, 
Do you love him? And how much?